Welcome to another CHRO Conversation, hosted by the Center for Executive Succession at the Darla Moore School of Business. I'm your host, Anthony Nyberg, and today we are speaking with Daryl Ford, Executive Vice President and CHRO of UPS. Daryl has also served as the CHRO of DuPont, Xerox, and AMD, and is on the board of IFW, a Fortune 500 company. Daryl, thank you very much for joining us today. We sincerely appreciate your coming here. Thank you. My pleasure. So you recently started at UPS, and they were already a little bit in the midst of uh, doing kind of an HR transformation. Can you describe a little what it's like to come in in the middle of one of those and then keep going the, yeah. the strong parts while adding the, the nuances? I would liken it to catching a speeding train. Uh, it was already moving fast. Um, multiple sort of initiatives, things changing, new technology, and then trying to figure out sort of what's really important and spending time sorting out what's really important versus what's noise, uh, while at the same time building relationships as well. Um, and it's been a fantastic sort of opportunity. I am working pretty hard, so right now it's a seven day a week sort of type effort in order to catch up uh, sort of with UPS, but we're making good progress. And you've, you've entered some organizations at some interesting times, both Exxon and DuPont before this. And what are some of the keys that you look for to, to do that, to, under, to catch that speeding train? Uh, I think it starts with, you know, the key question I always ask, the CEO, the CFO in particular, and I kind of start there. Where is value created? Where is value lost? What's important? To the HR team and to others, I asked about the culture. What's really important? What are the tripwires? Uh, in our culture uh, that uh, I should be aware of. So I ask questions like that. Uh, I also triangulate up, down, and across the organization from levels to functions, asking about perspective and how do we create value. And so with that, uh, I'm able to understand uh, the hydraulics of the business, uh, but also to understand culturally how things get done. And you've had to go through, I mean, you're, you're obviously this HR transformation now at UPS, but you've done that kind of everywhere you've been. Why are these kind of transformations necessary usually? Well, they're necessary for a few reasons. If I think back in my own sort of experience, uh, one, there was an activist, and the activist sort of instigated uh, the transformation. Uh, others, uh, at DuPont, company had been around 217 years. And so we were actually sort of moving the company, moving the assets to create value uh, for the organization, which required a major transformation. Coming into UPS, uh, UPS wants to modernize uh, the people agenda, total rewards, talent, culture. Uh, so there's an opportunity to do that. And they were looking for someone coming in from the outside uh, to interject sort of new thought leadership and a new perspective. And are there extra challenges associated with these kind of transformations when it's, a, when it's an iconic company? I mean, again, Exxon, DuPont, UPS, these are, these are parts yeah. of the fabric of our country even. So yeah. do they, does that create extra challenges for you? Well, or, and opportunities, I presume? Well, both challenge and opportunity. Uh, the, um, so one, you don't want to screw it up. <laughs> so that's a big part of it. The, you know, for me, um, it's a little more complex because the company has been successful. UPS has been successful for 114 years before I ever showed up, right? And so what's going to be different? Uh, DuPont was successful for 200 plus years. What's going to be different? So you have to be pretty thoughtful about sort of pulling various levers and making changes. Uh, you don't want to go too fast, too broad. You want to make sure that you pull people along with you as you're thinking about the future and shaping the organization sort of for the future. But a big part of that is anchored on the strategy. What are we trying to accomplish? How are we going to create value? Um, how are we going to sustain it? And do we have the organization skills, capabilities to deliver on that strategy, which is a big part of the HR agenda. So thinking about the HR skills that you talked about and, and trying to understand if you have the ones that are necessary for the strategy, can you talk a little bit about what, what kind of skills are, are maybe most necessary for HR professionals, either at UPS or more broadly? You know, from my perspective and from experience, uh, it comes back to value creation, business acumen, critically important. Before I jump into any sort of initiative, I need to understand the hydraulics of the business. What part of the P&L balance sheet am I working on? Uh, what am I trying to accomplish? And anchoring sort of there uh, is important. 
the conversation with my peers. I was just having this conversation two days ago with our CEO, uh, Carol Tomei, and she's really focused on commercial acumen as an organization, commercial acumen. And when we think about our strategy going forward, uh, competition, commercial acumen is key, not only for the HR professional, but for all of my peers across the C-suite as well. Uh, so I think that's going to be key. If I double click into HR sort of skills in particular, is really thinking about talent as a differentiator for value creation. Um, I fundamentally believe if my team is better than your team, we're going to win, right? And so talent as a differentiator uh, is key. And do you, so commercial acumen is actually not a, a term I've heard a lot of. Do you differentiate that much from business acumen? Commercial in a sense, they're pretty similar, okay. right? So pretty similar. So for us, uh, she uses the term commercial acumen in particular because we're integrating there's finance, there's marketing, leveraging all the various functions of business in order to create value and how they integrate sort of with each other. And so she uses the term commercial from that perspective uh, to think about the holistic uh, concepts of value creation. And as we think about these skills, do you think much has changed? I mean, in the last couple of years now have been pretty tumultuous. So do you th have we learned anything from, this in, from, the, from the pandemic in terms of we have different skills we need or, or would like other skills or, or anything else that way? The fundamentals of business are essentially the same, right? Uh, so I think we're good there, but how you get things done uh, is different. So when you think about the last sort of 18 months sort of working through a pandemic, you know, parts of my team I haven't seen in almost a year, right? But we're still a team. We're still effective. As a leader, how do you create that environment such that you can still stay connected sort of virtually and move a pretty aggressive agenda as well? Uh, I think those skills of connection, intimacy, relationships uh, are important. So the social skills of how you get things done uh, are more important than ever before. And do you think that there are different social skills needed when, we, when we're in this more virtual environment? Is that, is that a different set of skills than what we might have normally thought of as social skills? I don't think they're different. At least for me, they're not different, but you have to be more intentional with the ones that you have. So for example, uh, building connection uh, through Zoom, right? We can still take the first few minutes and build sort of social connection, check in with you know, the kids and the family and those kind of things. Now, where you may do that in person naturally, uh, doing it intentionally through video or through Zoom, uh, still fundamentally important. I think for me, it's being more intentional about that, making more time for it uh, as well, because we don't have the, you know, spontaneous breaks at the coffee uh, sort of counter or things like that. Uh, you have to be more intentional. When I'm talking to my sort of employee in, who runs international for us, uh, I've moved to weekly connections because I don't see him, you know, maybe four or five times a year, right? And so I've moved to weekly connections with him just to make sure that we stay connected, as an example. That's a really good lesson. Something I'm actually quite bad at is, you know, is checking in before these meetings start, that yeah. sort of thing. Because it does come natural in person. But, so yeah. I've, I've got to file that for myself to try to get better at it. Well, you know, you, you also prompted another thought, too. It's um, uh, one of the employees on our team sort of did this uh, sort of two meetings ago. Uh, we did a personal check-in, just a personal check-in. And I thought it was well done, which is we're all moving fast. Things are happening. And then we just said, pause, time out. Um, everybody, where are you, all right? Let's ground ourselves. How are you doing? And we were grateful for each other. And we spent time talking about how grateful we were for each other and why. And I thought that was a wonderful sort of connection point for us as we're, and we did this through Zoom, but still had the connection. So and that, that seems particularly important at a time like this also. So you're talking about talent. If your team has more talent, you're going to win. But it must also be the connection that that talent brings together. So it's not just a series of all-stars, but it's a series of all-stars that are working closely together. And this must help with that. Right? Uh, it, it has to, right? It's the, it's the team environment. Uh, I think about it in the UPS sort of context, the teamwork that's required because we run a global network. And with that network, 
all of the handoffs have to work seamlessly in, for, in order for those packages to be delivered. And so with that, teamwork is key. Uh, within our own HR team in particular, we're building a new team. And the relationships, the connection, the teamwork, the handoffs, trust, critically important. And I've heard you talk about the importance of culture before. Can you say a little bit about what culture means to you and, and why it's important in an organization? Yeah, I, I've been doing sort of culture work for some time. Many of the organizations that you reference um, have needed a culture change, and I was brought in to actually create that sort of culture change. Uh, new CEO, new culture, for example. Culture for me is really about sort of the behaviors, how things get done at University of South Carolina, how things get done at UPS. There's a connection set of behaviors for how things get done in order to create value. You want to be intentional about those behaviors. You know, each company organization has a set of values, generally speaking. Uh, UPS has so seven of those. There's a set of values, and I think of them as almost a book, you know, almost the binder of a book uh, as the values. They don't change, um, but the chapters change. The behaviors change. The behaviors that are important today uh, may be different than the ones we needed previous chapter. And so how do you actually intentionally change those chapters in order to compete? Um, and there's both art and science in how you change a culture. And then you look at process as an enabler to reinforce both those values as well as leadership behaviors uh, in order to accomplish a culture change. So how do you go about uh, changing a culture or, or nudging it in some way at a, at, again, at an iconic organization like, like you continually are at, um, while keeping the great aspects of that culture that already exist while nudging it in the way that you think make it maybe closer to the values? Is that part of it? Or? Yeah, uh, for, for us, you know, the conversation we're having at UPS sort of right now uh, is um, new strategy, um, better, not bigger, new CEO, leadership team in place. Uh, what needs to be different for us to compete uh, in this, uh, in this, at this time? And so for us, what we've done is uh, went on a listening tour uh, across the organization of everything from the frontline sort of leader to the folks who deliver our packages and drive our uh, sort of package car trucks to our Teamsters, to our pilots, uh, and everyone in between. And we talked about what's positive about our culture and then what needs to change. And we had this conversation across the entire organization. Uh, the CEO and I have also doing listening tours with our top leaders in the organization as well. We meet in sort of small intimate groups, five or six of us together, and we have these sort of conversations about what needs to change for us to be sort of better. And so as we put that together, uh, we actually have a collection of you know, sort of ideas and inputs and then you start to galvanize on those. What do we want to double down on? And then also to what do we need to change and why? Um, and for us, we're actually focused on leadership behaviors as a key enabler to that. And that's how we've actually defined our leadership model, uh, which we're in the process of rolling out now with these new behaviors and expectations of the future. All right, and as you said, you've been thinking about culture for a long time and you've discussed yeah. it and I've heard you discuss it for a long time, but did the pandemic, did, did this, heighten the importance of culture? Does it, does it, does it add anything to it or, or cause us to have to think about it in a different way? Well, it does. It does. Um, you know, there was an article in the, uh, I think it was the Wall Street Journal some several months ago now. And, you know, the perspective was your employees that are coming back to the office, your employees today are very different than your employees sort of 18 months ago. Very different. You need to reconnect with them. Uh, they've been operating pretty independently um, for the last 18 months. And so if you were a manager, using this as an example, if you were a manager that had to sort of just sort of, you know, sort of task oriented, had to more sort of more control, um, you know, that might not be a good representation sort of now uh, because of the independence that employees sort of have and the flexibility. And so I think things are different. Our employees are more independent sort of from that perspective. But also too, some things are fundamentally the same. The need for connection, the need for purpose, uh, and making sure that we have those conversations, be intentional about that, uh, I think is also helpful.
One of the things that UPS, seems somewhat unique to UPS, mm -hmm. I think, is the, the tremendous number of, of people that you need from a seasonal aspect. And you're now, even though it's only September to me, you're entering into that really busy season. You even yeah. said on the 4th of July, you start yes. planning. What are some of the, what are some of the challenges that, that occur for HR in particular to address that, that need? The biggest one is hiring, right? So how do you do peak hiring, surge hiring? Yeah, I think last year we hired close to 100,000 people in three months or something crazy like that. Think about that. So both process, talent, talent supply chain, the effectiveness of it, um, we need to, the agility that's required in order to flex an organization that quickly, uh, I think is important. And that's probably one of the most important things we're doing. But not only to sort of get them in the door, now you have to train them, make sure they're capable, uh, making sure that they're onboarded properly as well, uh, making sure they connect with UPS. Uh, we want them to stay, many of them, we want them to stay. Uh, and connect with us uh, over a longer period of time. And how do you do that? How do you maintain this strong culture that you're spending so much time trying to create when you bring in an extra third or quarter of your company for a, a relatively short period of time? Those individuals that join the company for peak season, we call it peak season, um, they're there for a period of time. We're not gonna keep all 100,000 of them, but we will keep some portion of those individuals sort of going forward. For us, it goes back to our values, uh, what we stand for. Uh, Jim Casey is one of our founders uh, of the company. Um, you know, his picture is right there in the hall as we walk into the door. And I give him a nod every time I walk into the office area. And, you know, Jim Casey was a man ahead of his time. You know, everything we've talked about from agility to accountability to social connection and purpose, uh, he talked about, you know, almost 75 years ago. And when I think about that, it's making sure that we anchor back to what got us to this point. What anchor back to those things that were successful some years ago, because the blueprint was there. The blueprint is there. And so whenever we lose our way, we kind of go back to that. And for us, it's making sure that our new employees uh, are grounded in those principles that uh, the company was founded upon. I presume that in each of your experiences, you've grown personally and gained, as you gain new experiences, et cetera. How about at UPS now? Can you talk about anything that you have now kind of learned in, in this step? Oh, each, uh, each opportunity is a learning. Uh, the, but personally, to your, to your question there, and I've been reflecting on this, the, the one that's sort of coming through now is trust. Trust myself, trust my instincts, trust my experiences that they're on full display at UPS. Uh, given what we're trying to do, the size and the magnitude of what we're trying to do as well, uh, is to trust those, not to doubt them. And so if anything, there's a greater confidence and appreciation for those experiences that I've had before that actually have prepared me for this assignment now. Uh, and so every now and then you might sort of doubt yourself and like, yeah, that's, yeah but uh, trust in it. Um, and uh, it will pay off. And how about from, uh, again, kind of from the pandemic? Did, are there leadership lessons that you've taken from this? Yeah, the, you know, for me, it's about intentional connections, uh, being very intentional. Uh, I mentioned my employee in uh, you know, international. Uh, going to a weekly sort of connection was important because I knew that's what he needed and that's what we needed. Um, uh, another one of my employees needs something different. So finding out where my direct reports, where my team are and what they need, and then adjusting my style, my approach to what they need, right? It's, 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 it's not about me, right? It's about servant leadership and how can I be of service to them? Uh, that orientation is probably more true uh, after these last 18 months uh, than ever before. And uh, some of the people on your team would actually like to know what books you've been reading lately that have kind of helped influence uh, some of these transformations for you or some of the lessons that you've been learning. So I'm working on, so I'm one of those sort of serial readers. I read chapters from multiple books at all different times. And so um, uh, right now I'm working on the, uh, the CEO test, um, sort of working on that one. Uh, the other one I'm working on uh, it's, it's called It's the Manager. It's the Manager. It's a book published by Gallup. I uh, forget the actual offer, but it came through Gallup and some of their research in particular. And for me, why is that important? The, 
you know, the principles, you know, sort of in that book in particular, sort of go back to organizations that have differentiated performance, that it ties back to the manager and the manager as a key difference maker in those relationships and sort of building connections and driving the business, driving process, that that's the differentiator. So the quality of the manager in particular as a differentiator for value creation uh, is the uh, big idea that I'm working on right now. It sounds quite interesting, yeah. really. So I have to, I'm gonna have to look in that one. You, uh, you've recently joined uh, a public board, ITW, yeah. right? Can you share a little bit about what you think the value of having someone, particularly with an HR background, is on a, on a major board like that? That's still moderately unique. Joining ITW, uh, so first of all, you know, this idea and this opportunity sort of presented itself. And as it presented itself, you know, one of the things I was asked this question about, you know, what are your unique sort of, you know, sort of contributions to a board? And then if you sort of pull back and you think about a board, what is a board responsible for? Governing the company, picking and selecting the CEO, managing risk. And then when you think about it through, through culture, uh, also is becoming increasingly important at boards, diversity becoming increasingly important at boards. Well, this is kind of what CHROs do, right? We select talent, we know talent. Uh, we manage risks. Uh, we typically are involved in sort of the risk committees for, uh, for the company. Uh, when you think about diversity, equity, inclusion, we're typically managing that or leading that sort of particular effort. Uh, being business-minded about value creation and strategy, uh, we're typically pretty good at that as well. And so all of these attributes are the role of a CHRO. And so many companies are starting to awaken to that perspective uh, and realize that uh, we actually have a voice and we have something to contribute. And and on that topic, so either from the board perspective or, or CHRO perspective, you're you, um, you're really unique in the, that you've been CHRO for a number of women CEOs. Mm. Is is there something? Can you point to the the things that companies can be doing to make sure that we're we are actually having a a better pipeline of diverse talent? Yeah, it's interesting. We were talking about this at dinner the other night. Um, I hadn't thought about it until recently, uh, but I've been uh, sort of the CHRO for three female CEOs. Um, and I'm pretty proud of that. It wasn't by design, but it just sort of worked out that way. And uh, some of them, I mean, just iconic sort of leaders uh, as well. And what I would share, what is common you know, across sort of those three experiences is that their development, their rise to the CEO, the top job, was not an accident. They were very intentional sort of development steps along the way. So both from them individually and from the, com from the company's perspective. Precisely. Okay. And so I'm going back to one of those. I'll leave, leave names aside for a minute. The, I remember the conversation that I was leading with the board about what do you need to see in this person in order for you to consider them as the next CEO? And the board articulated three things. It wasn't seven, it wasn't 10. It was like three things they needed to see. Then we actually worked on those three things. Um, and within two years, she became CEO. Um, I'm thinking about uh, Ursula Burns in particular at Xerox and her development uh, and exposure to the C-suite early, exposure to the board and the rotation in assignments uh, in order for her to become CEO. Um, it was not an accident. Talent management was a differentiator in creating the opportunities uh, for her to be into, you know, to become a CEO. So talent management is key. Exposure is key uh, as I think about differentiating and creating more diverse uh, CEOs of the future. So is, is that intentionality something that you'll be able to bring to uh, these public boards and, and CHROs more broadly, probably? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's a lens that I look through. It's a lens that's sort of with me. Um, uh, acting with purpose. Acting with purpose. When we think about the succession planning at sort of UPS or other companies, uh, it's not an accident that you get the outcome. And so let's start early. And then let's be intentional about those choices and the investments that we're making. And you're about to speak to all of our masters of human resource students. And so I'm sure you'll tell them, but 
What, what will you tell them is maybe the most important skills that they should be thinking about, particularly early in their career? Yeah, early in their career, if it's skills, I would say um, learn the language of the business. Learn the language of the business. Um, you know, at my level, I don't spend a lot of time on HR sort of techniques. Uh, you know, I was just in a strategy session with our leadership team at UPS. It was about markets, it was about competition, it was about technology, it was about resource allocation. None of that, you know, sort of is, you know, sort of technical HR 101 type things. So you got to learn the language of the business because much of the opportunity and the impact that we can make as CHROs comes out of those business opportunities. And then the application of our skills, our capability, our perspective to those uh, opportunities I think is a unique opportunity to create value. One of the other things that we do here on this, uh, in this Darla Moore School of Business and on campus involves entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And a number of people kind of think about entrepreneurship as leveraging innovation to create sustainable value. Does UPS find an entrepreneurship education or an entrepreneurship mindset to be helpful in a career? Um, absolutely. So if you go to our sort of our strategy that we've communicated, you know, there are three pillars sort of to it. You know, the first one is all about the customer. Uh, the second one is about being people led. And then the last one is about being innovation driven. Innovation driven. It's out of that sort of category in particular, when we think about uh, one of the ones that's sort of top of mind sort of innovation is putting RFD chips uh, in packages so we actually know where they are around the world. That became increasingly important when we were delivering uh, the world's first vaccine uh, from Pfizer. You want to know where that package is, right? And so uh, technology, innovation, using that sort of mindset to actually embed RFD chips uh, into packages so we can track them, uh, pretty important. Developing a coal supply chain came out of innovation as well. How do we develop this capability? So short answer is yes, uh, important. Uh, when you think about innovation, innovation driven, new ideas uh, to create value, very important. So when you're thinking about promoting people either within the organization or bringing new people to the team, are, is that uh, ability for them to be creative thinking, to be innovative, is, that, is it really front of mind? Uh, it is. I'll just reflect on uh, conversations just recently with our leadership team. Being curious minded is the conversation. Being curious minded, whether you're in HR, marketing or finance, but being curious minded uh, is uh, something that we're looking to cultivate in leaders at UPS in particular. But we think it's important for innovation. We think it's important for productivity. We think it's important for engagement uh, and bringing your whole self to work and applying that creativity to solve business problems. Does that uh, creativity, innovation, curiousness uh, which it sounds like one of the real values of UPS, one of the core uh, things that are important to it. Do you think UPS does that more than other companies or values that more than some others? And has that contributed to the tremendous success of UPS? I would say it's important. I couldn't say more than other companies. You know, they're very sort of different in the application, uh, but it's very important to us. The fact that innovation driven is one of our strategic pillars says that it's important customer being the other, and then being people-led uh, being the other two. So very important to us for value creation, uh, and also to creating, uh, sort of providing a service. Uh, when you think about UPS, we don't have a product per se. We provide a service. And so you think about innovation, the application of it, uh, creating a service, creating a better experience uh, for our customers uh, is important. That's going to be different than DuPont. You know, DuPont is, uh, we had uh, a number of scientists that did pure research. It was their whole sort of, uh, sort of reason for being, is just pure research. Uh, that's important for that business model, and so I would say the application would be different out of DuPont versus UPS, but again, it depends on what we're trying to accomplish. As always, thank you for coming down here and joining us. It's, it's a great treat for me personally and uh, for our whole school, so thank you for joining us. Thank you, great to be here. You just listened to another CHRO conversation. Today, Daryl Ford, CHRO for UPS, shared some of the lessons learned in starting as a CHRO in a well-established firm 
along with the importance of prior experiences in making that transition. Darrell also discussed the importance of culture and what role the CHRO has in maintaining a corporate culture and how a new person can go about understanding what that corporate culture is and ought to be. On behalf of all of us who are associated with the Master of Human Resources program and the Center for Executive Succession here at the University of South Carolina, thank you for joining us.